<laughs> hey, Ryan, I'm so excited to talk with you about just, you know, I'm not even sure what my question is, but as I've been looking around, as I've been kind of really sitting with my own layoff, I wanted to talk to someone who was in maybe a higher level position or like, you know, that management level position and just kind of like get some details around like what that looks like at a big company versus a small company, kind of like what that like what engineering management looks like in general. And you just you're the first person that came to mind. You've been talking about this stuff for a really long time, just deeply respected by so many people that I respect. Um, and so I just want to, you know, thank you for joining me today. I'm really excited to chat with you. Thanks for having me. I'm excited. I mean, it's been like, you know, before we hit record, I mean, you and I had said like, we've, we should have been talking a long time ago. Um, so I'm excited have, yeah. to talk with you. So thanks for having me. I love it. <laughs> so um, I guess for anyone who doesn't already know, you have had worked at Netflix for eight plus years. Is yeah, right? it's like eight and a half. It wasn't nine yet, but getting close to nine years. Yeah, that's wild. So you saw a tremendous amount of change, I'm sure. In Absolutely. Those eight years. Yeah. I mean, even you mentioned at the start there about like small to like big companies. And like when I started my, you know, I've worked as an engineer, various small, large companies. Uh, and as a manager, I moved into uh, management at Evernote, which was a fairly small startup at the time. I think it was a few hundred people. So then even moving to Netflix was a lot bigger. But at the time, it was only a couple thousand you know, people like not, yeah. not just engineers, like literally people across the <laughs> yeah, board. Yeah, sure. <laughs> I think now it's probably like three, four thousand engineers, right? Totally. Um, an upward of 10. I don't even know how many employees are there anymore. It's like that. It's yeah. grown significantly through my time of being there. Yeah, that's that's wild. Now, when you joined Netflix, was it as an engineer and then you moved into management or uh, did you start on that management track? I stayed on the management track. So when I was at Evernote, I had about a year or so as a manager, maybe a year and a half uh, doing that. And so I was enjoying it. And so when Netflix was reaching out, asking uh, me to join, it was it was for a manager role um, and, and really in a space that I was really excited about. They called it the acquisition UI space. So it was doing all the sign up flows for iOS, Android, web and TV and oh, doing a ton of sick. A-B tests. Like I love the A-B test aspect of it too. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. You know, like building a product and seeing how it does, iterating on it, what works, what doesn't. And totally. at that scale of having so many people constantly signing up or logging into Netflix, yeah. you get a lot of that data. And so that, that truly excited me and still does. Like I still yeah. get excited to talk about those things. You know, so that's something that's really interesting is I, I feel like one of the big questions that I have going through this process is like, what is it that I actually like about the developer experience, DevRel engineering stuff? Because the more people that I talk to, the more companies have it in like a slightly different place. Like maybe it's under the product org or like it's very clearly under marketing or like some people have it like tied to, you know, tied strictly to engineering. And it's like very, it's like, Nobody does it the same. And I think my one of my questions kind of going into this is like, did did I do I like this, but would actually like something else more? Right. Like maybe there's like an engineering an engineering manager track that was like, oh, it sounded weird. But like, actually, I might have actually liked that. <laughs> it, it's true. Like even if the dev rel stuff, it's like you're dealing with people a lot. Right. You yeah, know, yeah, like totally. you do and in, in, in ways and in that and whereas management, yeah, it's similar. It's like you're you're still deal with the technology. I'm still yeah. close to that, still care and get excited to like what's the new framework? What, what, what will that <laughs> sure. do for that? It's like I still enjoy that, even though I'm not yeah. necessarily hands on keyboard. It's like those things are still enjoyable and you get to talk with your team and, and things, but you're also dealing with just people challenges, plain and simple. Yeah. And, and to me, that has always been exciting, whether it be a small mm -hmm. company or a big company. Um, you're dealing with a team who needs you for other things than just coding, right? Like the, yeah. your job is different. You're you're not necessarily better or higher, even how you said. It's like, oh, you're like in a higher position. It's like, yeah, kind of. But it's like, to me, sure. you're just playing a different role on the team. Yeah, that's, that's something. It's like, I always fall into that trap of like calling it like that because I think there are functions functions where you have maybe executive authority True. that make it feel higher. Yeah. But I think you're right. There's, there's, it's, it's a different function and it's helpful 
for me to be reminded of like, okay, it's just a, it, it's a different role. And like, sometimes we can think about it in a way that makes it dysfunctional, which is unfortunate. Uh, and, and I'm curious, like, did, did you end up having to combat that a lot to be the, you know, wonderful, beloved engineering manager that, <laughs> I, I that we all so, know you yeah. to be? <laughs> Like, yeah. I, I definitely do think that it's easy to get there, too, because it's like a natural hierarchy, right? Like there's, you know, it's levels of manager, director, VP, C-suite, whatever. It's like you can titles in there and it's like that's just natural. That's, you know, engineer, you've got a manager, right? And so that <laughs> is there. And so you're combating that no matter what. Yeah. Um, but then even people like, unfortunately, managers have a lot of power, though, too, right? Like hiring mm -hmm. and firing. That's yeah. a huge one. Like, do I want this totally. person to join my team? Is it working well? I have to make those decisions. And so already that's going to kind of put that like little bit of power there, um, which could be ab abused essentially. Like definitely we've all seen cases of that. So there is that. But I think even just, you know, the one thing, a couple of the engineers on my team over the years, one in particular would always call me. He's like, all right, boss. And I'm like, please don't call me your boss. <laughs> like it's like it just doesn't feel like it's like. I don't like that. It's like, I look at it as more like, I don't want to tell you what to do, right? Like, I don't want to be like, hey, engineer, you go build this and do it this exact way. And this is what we do. It's more like, how do I like convince someone? You know, how do I like help talk through like, the, why are we doing this? What's the impact? But then also let an engineer understand that context to make something the way they should make it, right? Like when you know all the variables going into it, it's like, okay, we need to ship quickly you're going to be like, all right, well, maybe I'm not going to spend, you know, tons of time writing my own framework. I'm going to pull something out because I don't have time to do that. You know, like you start to think about these things. And so a lot of it is influence is the way I look at it as a leader. It's not mm -hmm. like hierarchical. It's like if someone on my team is like, well, my manager told me to do it. I'm like, no, please never. If that ever comes out of your mouth, like, no, it's like you should be bought in. And if you're not, let's talk about yeah. that too, right? Because maybe yeah. I'm completely missing something. Mm. I really like that. Yeah, it's it's such a hard thing to describe because I think that we don't have good external metaphors for it. You know, like, I mean, like you could, could say like a coach maybe, but like even... It, it, it's kind of it's kind of different. Like a lot of times they were players, you know, kind of in their heyday. But it, it, there's kind of a retired aspect of that. And it's like you're not necessarily a retired engineer, like, no, to no. Uh, you know, to be an engineering manager. It's kind of so I don't know. It's, it, there's there's nothing that I found that really kind of settles around like what exactly that is. Maybe it is more like I like the analogy of maybe of coach, but it's not a coach yeah. that you're just like a player on the team doing a different role, right? Like because there's mm -hmm, certain mm -hmm. things that you're planning for, like what's the next couple quarters that we're doing for work at, at while engineers yeah. are in the trenches doing that work um, yeah. at the quarter the, the time. And you're kind of like, oh, yeah, I've got to plan out and be ahead of things. <laughs> what's, you know, do I need to hire people? I need to go invest in that. So I think it's like maybe it's like, if you took like an analogy of like a sports team, like soccer or something, it's like maybe you're the goalie. I don't know. Like you're you're doing something. Interesting. So the yeah. Can go score. I like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like you have a distinctly different role, like yes. different kit, different everything. Like you're facing the different direction. Like and not in, not in soccer, but like um, yeah, that's 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 a really great uh, metaphor. I like that. I like that a lot. I'm gonna have to think about that. So. In your role, you've definitely had to like fire people, let people go, you know, all that. How I'm curious, what is that experience like when you don't necessarily have control over the decision? Because I think, you know, a lot of times I think it's, it's really easy to be like, oh, this team is not functional with this person and everybody knows it. So we need to do something. I am serving the team in this way. But sometimes like in a layoff type situation, you, it's just going through, the decision is going through you. It's passing through you. I'm curious, um, what is that experience like on your side of things to have to go through that with a person, you know, on your team? Yeah, good question. I think like, you're right. Like there's times where it's almost so obvious, like, you know, there's like team members are like, oh, thank God that person's gone. Like, it's like, I like to call it like someone like they're a jerk, right? Like you're like, they might even be good at their job, but you're like, everyone's sure. like, oh my God, I just can't stand working with that person. Un that's almost the easy thing. I mean, I don't think it's ever easy letting someone go, like regardless as as a manager at the end of the day, 
it's it's people like, that you're dealing with. You know, we all have you know families or expenses or whatever, and like people are dependent on their jobs. So bear one. It's like even if someone needs to go, it still sucks. But yeah, so then then there's the you know okay that's like makes sense. Everyone's like good job. We we definitely needed to get rid of that person. It wasn't going well, and that's obvious. There's also the times where someone is actually good uh, or performing fairly well, but maybe they're just not right for that particular role. Um, that can happen too, where you're like, yeah, this just, and it might not even be up their alley too, right? You're getting them to do work that they're not passionate about, you know? So there's that where that's totally. even a little bit harder, but then to what you're getting at too, on the layoff side is it's a business decision, right? Like it's likely that, hey, someone really high up above a manager for sure is deciding <laughs> we're we're not going to invest in this area anymore or we can't and we've got to cut some of the people and half yeah. your team's gone. And like mm-hmm. you as the manager are being told that, right? Like you're not yeah. making that decision. Maybe you're part of the discussion. Some companies might bring you in. It, it all differs on that. And then you likely have to be part of the message, right? In some way, shape or form, maybe HR yeah. steps in and does the layoff, but you might have to do that as the manager or you have to deal with the people who are still at at the job, right? Like, so if yes. the team's gone, you got to message that. And I think a lot of a lot of weight gets put on managers for having to just mm. be the messenger of some of these things, yeah. you know, and, and come across as authentic too. You don't want to be like, oh yeah, th- we had to do this. It's fine. You know, I just taking orders. It, it's like, that's yeah. not a great message or it's okay, everyone. It's fine. We'll, we'll be fine. That's not good either. It's this weird <laughs> balance of like, you don't want to throw the leaders above you under the bus. And you also don't want to be like, it's okay. We're going to be great. And the hunky dory. <laughs> totally. It's like, there's this weird middle ground that it's not an easy task to deliver that message. And sometimes managers aren't brought in at all. They're just literally finding yeah, out the same crazy. time the rest of the team is. And oh. then the rest of the team looks at their manager and goes, what's happening? And yeah, so that's, like, it's this weird situation. I'll find out. <laughs> yeah, you're like, I'll go dig in because I play that role. I've got to go look for that I- information yeah, for you. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, man, that's wild. That's wild. I Right now is such a wild time. You know, I think, you know, we've seen so many people be like very visible with the layoff process. And, you know, we've, we're seeing more of it in our industry, which is really wild. Um, you know, I think that it's been like just on this upswing for a really long time. And I think that uh, so many people are feeling the weight of money not being free right now. <laughs> which, I mean, tech in general was like, it, you know, money was just everywhere, right? Like it was like people were getting paid a lot of large salaries, VCs were throwing money at every startup and everything. And that's changed. The landscape has drastically changed and change is hard in itself, right? Yes. Even if you still yeah. have your job, you know, people are dealing with like, maybe they're not getting large comp increases or, yep. you know, it's harder to find jobs because there's not as many mm-hmm. out there as that we used to have where it was like, oh, you're an engineer. Uh, I've got like 30 jobs. It's like, <laughs> we, we need to hire you. It's, it's yeah, that pick. has changed drastically. And that even if you're not laid off, that's just tough dealing with that change. Yeah. And then, yeah, anyone dealing with layoffs is so hard. You know, it's yeah. just being around it. Yeah. Well, I wanted to ask you, like, so one of the things like, kind of of my own personal interest is that I've always worked at small companies. I think um, it has always just felt comfortable for me and I've never really had much of an interest in doing something different. I think also up till, you know, pre-COVID, it was like you'd have to move to New York or San Francisco to even entertain the idea of working at a at a larger company. But I know that a lot of that's changed. Um, a lot of bigger companies are openly remote. Um, so I'm curious for anyone looking to make that switch, um, what do you see as maybe the biggest differentiators between how a you know maybe smaller startup works and a big company like Netflix? Ooh, that's a good question. Um... Yeah, in terms of right. like employment and like team dynamics, like in t- like what you would expect kind of making that jump. Yeah, I think like there's on the employment side or kind of the work and focus that you're doing, I think the key word being focus, um, like when you're at a larger company, some may even go too granular where you have too much of like a small focus. Um, but you 
are having a little more focus and discipline on like what you or your team does. And and that may change over time or whatever, but you're not trying to do everything, right? Like at a startup, you kind of just have to where it's like, hey, we need this back end or we need something connecting to the database. And, you know, you just kind of have to sometimes do it, right? Even if you're like, yes. I've never done this before. <laughs> I'm not the expert in this, but you're you're just trying to get something out the door. And I, some of that wearing multiple hats is so exciting too, right? Um, I think I personally get excited on both sides of the coin there where it's like being at a startup and like being able to just like figure things out and, you know, do it good enough just to get something out and like learn from it is so powerful. I love that. And then being at the big company, being able to really focus in your area and understand it deeply, like from a, you know, technical standpoint, but also even some of the business standpoint of like, what's the impact that my team has? What do we care about? And let's focus on that and really deeply understand and and pay attention to. I think those or areas just to like at a broad level, I, I think yeah. are really important. Um, I don't know, big companies, it varies. Some, I feel like smaller companies seem to have like, you care more on a people level. I don't know if that's a fair statement, but like, you know, everyone, like yeah. it's like, it's a small yeah, company, yeah, yeah. So you kind of know people more. Getting even, am it's I, like, cheers. Where yeah, like it's like, you know name. them. And, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, that's special. I think that's really cool. And then as even being at Netflix, I felt like when I first started, I knew a ton of people. And then over the years, and especially during COVID, as we start hiring, you know, more remote friendly and, and all that, which is awesome. I'm so thankful that the company did that. But it makes it different because you don't know totally. as many people. It's bigger and it's harder to make those connections. Yeah, yeah. Like you might only see someone on your team in person once a year, which right. is like yeah. such a departure from, you know, like working side by side. <laughs> and I don't think you need to always be like in the office or I know some companies are forcing people to like multiple days. I don't know what the right formula is. Yeah. There is yeah. something magical of bringing people together. Is it once totally. a year? Is it, you know, once a quarter? I don't know what that is, but there's something there when you you just have that personal connection. I don't think you need yeah. to be full time in the office. That flexibility, mm -hmm. I think, is the right balance. But um, yeah, it's different. It is just a different world. It is. <laughs> I'm curious from the the management perspective, what are some key skills that you've seen in team members um, that you've worked with that have made them, I guess, just like obvious, you want to keep them around for forever, right? Like what are, what are the things that kind of set someone apart from like just being like a great coder to being like an invaluable asset to a team? Yeah. Wow. That's a, that's an awesome question. Um, I think one thing it sparked when you were talking, I was thinking about like in the interview process is even something that I think about, like, what am I looking for? Right. Um, there's definitely certain types of people that I've noticed over time that, you know, I've hired a ton, especially at Netflix, I've hired a lot of people. And so you, you start to really look for certain signals um, and also start to see how that plays out once you've hired people. Um, and my biggest thing that I would say, it has nothing to do with the technical side. It has nothing to do with all these things that you would think. Um, my biggest thing that I think has really helped longevity of, of folks, happiness, creativity, all those things is having someone with aptitude right? It's like, that is this willingness to learn and showing up with this curiosity. It, it just really shows up so well. It's like, there's like some humbleness too, right? Where you're like, I don't know everything. I, I don't expect you to. I, I don't think everyone does know everything. And, but that willingness to always learn and adapt and like, just figure things out. It's so powerful. And I think that to me has been my number one thing that sometimes you could have someone who's like the most senior engineer, the best of the best. And it's like, but they might be best in their niche too, right? And they're, and that's okay. There's nothing wrong with that. That sometimes you need that. But I think when I, when I think overall, it's aptitude of like they're, they might not even be that tenured in their career, but they're hungry to keep learning it's it's pretty powerful. Yeah, that's really interesting. And I, I like, I can see that, you know, probably my closest management, like practical management experience is just um, having two kids. And I oh, see huge. that sometimes. That is management, man. <laughs> I see that sometimes with them. 
um, you know, we've been working with them on a like growth mindset and staying curious and believing that everything is a solvable problem. And it's it, it can go sideways. And I, and I definitely feel like, you know, their natural inclination is to be like, well, it's cursed forever. <laughs> it's like, no, like you can you can get through this. Like and I want to like I'm going to hands off for a second and just make you go through it. <laughs> and like it's hard. Like, that's why it's easier it to kind of just be like, well, yeah, it's messed up. It's not being fixed or it's, you know, maybe it won't ever, you know, if it's a broken toy, it may never be yeah. the same as it used to be. But like knowing that you can try and figure something out and also make mistakes. I love yeah. making mistakes. I like, I think that is the number one thing that you, we should all do is like celebrate <laughs> mistakes, right? Because yes. it's like, that's how we learn. That's how you get better. Mm -hmm. You know, the first time mm -hmm. you like made a website, like mine was terrible. Like I can think <laughs> of so many things I've learned every single time that I've done and built an application yeah. and you learn constantly. And like, if you get too hung up on being perfect, I, I don't think you can. So don't yeah. worry about it. Just like make those mistakes and you won't make them again. People always ask like, how do you go from like, you know, junior to mid-level to, to senior? And yeah. a lot of the senior aspect, it's a lot of it is just like you've had experience making mistakes and you've learned from <laughs> yeah. those mistakes. Yeah, you got scar tissue. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> There's, I, I, man, I watched this really great, uh, just short form video from uh, Ben Ornstein um, from Tuple. And he was sharing some advice from the Go player community about the advice that they give all beginners is to lose your first hundred games as fast as possible. And because everyone knows this is just exposure, right? Like you have to like train the system to recognize the patterns. And um, he said he's noticed like in startups, there's kind of this similar thing where someone decides to, you know, go for it. And when they're asking for their advice, what they're asking for is like, how can I win my first game? And that's like, the, that's always the wrong question. It's like, how do I lose progressively towards the goal that I want to, to get to? And that's hard for, that's hard for us, right? Like we all just want to be like, first time expert. That's me. Yeah, like, <laughs> how, how do I get past that? Like, I don't, I don't want to make those mistakes. Like, why do I have to go through that? And I think there's definitely ways to avoid that because like, we all share things like openly the internet is so powerful that Twitter yeah, community, yeah. all those things is like you can learn from other mistakes, but mm -hmm, you're still mm -hmm. going to make tons of new mistakes yourself. And like, that's totally. okay. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, that's wonderful too, right? Like that's kind of standing on the shoulders of giants is like seeing all of the people in your community, trusting their experience and being like, okay, cool. Like I, I don't have to make that mistake now because I saw it made from someone yeah. whom I trust, someone with curiosity that I trust. <laughs> yeah. And it's like, Hopefully we can save someone some mistake, right? That they don't have to yeah. make and then they'll make mistakes and hopefully they share it. And, you know, it's like we just get yes. smarter and better because of those things. Yeah, yeah. Now, um, before we started this call, um, it, we were talking a little bit about creativity. And I just wanted to um, ask you about kind of this, this recent opportunity that you've created for yourself to have some space to explore videography and photography. And I, I've really been enjoying seeing this aspect um, of you. As you decided to step away from work, what have you noticed about kind of your your, your feeling and, and that time as you've like kind of intentionally uh, taken a step back from that role? One, I'm super privileged to have the ability to do that. And like, I know not everyone can do that. And so that's something I like, I'm truly like fortunate to have that, just that space to say like, I'm taking a step back. You know, for me, I thoroughly enjoyed my time at Netflix and I, I miss a lot of the aspects of it too. You know, it's just such a great place to work. I loved all the people I worked with, but there was something in me that realized like I needed a change, right? Like it just needed a change. And I wasn't really sure what that change was. And like, I was like, well, I don't need to rush it. I, I know that a change needs to happen. And so I just kind of was like, I'm going to take some time off and just figure out what's next. But a lot of it too came down to, I realized I need to be creative just in my life, my entire life growing up, like from an early kid, I was drawing, you know, making skate videos as a kid, uh, painting graffiti, all these different things of all these aspects. I need to be creative to be happy. Um, I've always done photography, uh, made little videos here and there, um, just just for fun, right? And and that I truly love doing. And so part of it was like, I felt this bent, 
built up where I wasn't doing enough to be creative. And I think even as a manager, leader at Netflix or tech companies, there's creativity happening. Like definitely it's like, and I just was finding I was in this rut where I, maybe it was just no new challenges. I'm not sure what it was, but yeah, right now it's like, I am taking a break and what I've been doing is just like going out and taking a ton of photos, videos, and just like being outside and everything. I feel amazing. Like I feel like this great energy, new ideas popping into my head. It's just something I hadn't, I wasn't feeling like, and it, it's, it's wild. It's been, you know, three or four months and my head is like just completely in a different space. It's wild. Yeah. It's, you know, it's so interesting. I, I feel like there's something in the air right now, like specifically where I don't know. I like there, there is this, this is so stupid, but like just that, like that gut feeling, I think of like, I need to do something for I don't even know how to, I don't even know how to put it. Like, I, I'll just put it in practical terms because this is the only way I've been able to describe it. But like over Christmas break, uh, my wife Nelly was like, Hey, what, um, what do you want to do? And I was like, you know, honestly, like I just, I want to have some time where I just code for fun. And I'd never been able to express that before. And to, to be able to say like, I want to code for fun and I know it's going to look like work. It's going to look like, Oh, like he's over on his laptop or whatever, just, you know, grinding out on some, you know, work thing. And I just need you to know that it's it's something that I just need to do for me. And like, I'll probably just throw it away, like whatever. But there's a, a thing in me that just has to do this thing. Like I'm just vibrating for it. and I just haven't had the time for it. And it's it's so cool to see when people like you give yourself the space for that and be like, I, I, I don't know what it is, but like, it, it's going to break out of me. And like, yes. I, I should do it when I'm happy, not when I'm sad <laughs> <laughs> or mad, even worse, mad, you know, there's something that we've, we often turn off a lot of the times in order to like survive, especially the last, like, I don't know, four years or whatever. It's just been crazy. And I think that like a lot of us are suffering from, not listening to that enough. <laughs> oh yeah. And people are like unhappy. It's like, yeah. it sucks. And it's like almost, I think we need some baticals in general. Like every company should yeah. you know, award that. Cause even like, I think some of where my head's at is even, I have like ideas that are popping for like even my old role in Netflix. I was like, oh, I would have done this differently. <laughs> and it's totally. like, I think it's, it's hard to, you know, quantify as, you know, as a company who is like, you know, bottom yeah. line, they're a business, they want to make money. Sure. You, you know, it'd be really tough to say like, yeah, we, we give, you know, six months to, you know, once every few years to our engineers that they just can take a break and they're getting paid and they, they're just not working. Um, yeah, yeah. But like, I feel like there's probably something powerful there that it's, you know, yes. I don't know what that would look like. And it probably is going to be not a financially mm -hmm. good thing to do, but there might be some like big wins that come out of it. Yeah. Too. Yeah. I just, I just did a call with uh, Selma, who's been making these really incredible videos um, uh, just about her own human experience. And I was asking how that was going over with, you know, her team and her manager and all that kind of stuff. And she was like, oh, my manager like loves it. She told me to keep going for it because she can see that it is changing the way that I creatively think about problems at work. And um, I don't know, I just like, it, I think you have such an important role in people's lives to be able to identify that and say like, okay, I, I see, I see what you're doing. I don't quite understand it, but I want to like, I want to support it and like, kind of like come beside you. Cause I think there's something special here. And, um, I just, I know you've done that for a lot of people. And, uh, so yeah, so thanks for, thanks for being an inspiration. Thanks for answering all my questions. Um, I, I'm, I've already taken you way past the time that I said I would. So, uh, yeah, just thanks so much for hanging out with me today. <laughs> no, thanks for having me. This is a blast. I mean, that's like, it is fun <laughs> hanging out and having these conversations and just like go, thinking about these things. Yeah, yeah. 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 It's I, all of these conversations I've left being like, Oh, I, like, I didn't think about it from that perspective. And I'm glad that I have that, that piece available to me now, you know? <laughs> yeah, no, it's like doing these conversations is like, even that in itself, like it's fun to talk with people. Like I miss interviewing people. Like that was kind of a force factor. You just like totally talk to people and hear about their experiences, how they think about things. It's a, it's powerful.
<laughs> yeah, it really is. It is. It is. Well, thank you for uh, kind of engaging in that power with me today. Um, and yeah, we'll see it. Where, um, where can people find you to uh, kind of see all your great photos and whatever happens next? Yeah, good question. I've uh, like all over the place, but uh, <laughs> I mean, uh, I run a podcast called Front End Happy Hour. So you can find that at frontendhappyhour.com, pretty much wherever you like to listen to podcasts. Um, but also, yeah, mostly on Twitter at Burgess D. Ryan. Uh, I have been posting a lot more to Instagram. I think it's just Ryan dot Burgess. Probably should have yeah. thought about that and just made them all the same. But hey, here it. we go. Um, <laughs> but yeah. <laughs> And I, I've started awesome. posting more to YouTube as well. Like that's like, Heck yeah. yes, like YouTube content is, I'm enjoying a lot more. That's it's something great. I've discovered too. Yeah, 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 it's, it's fun. There's a lot of, there's a lot of creative stuff happening. It's very, very inspiring. <laughs> yes, I, I'm like regretful that it took me this long to, I mean, I obviously was on YouTube, but like wasn't as in paying attention as much. Yeah, yeah, well, now's your time. Now's your yeah. time. <laughs> exactly. Cool. Thanks so much, Ryan. Thank you.